those of you that are staying in here, if you would take your Bibles and open them up to the book of James. We're continuing to walk through James chapter 3 this morning. We've been spending time talking about the tongue uh, and what the Bible has to say about it. Last week we uh, went through this chapter and really uh, saw how James introduced the idea of really being concerned about the words that we use uh, and the interactions that we have and what it is that we say and sometimes what it is that we don't say. We talked about all those types of things. James started out basically by introducing the idea that uh, many of us should be careful about teaching or preaching or being in positions of leadership. He said that there's a a danger and a warning that comes with that because uh, those of us that teach or lead or preach will be held accountable for what we say. And the truth is, all of us will be held accountable for what we say. In addition to all of us being held accountable, all of us stumble and struggle with the words that we use. We spoke about how our tongue, even though it's such a small part of our body, has great repercussions. It has large consequences on our person. And we're going to explore those a little bit more. We ended last week talking about the control over our tongue. And how try as we might, we have no ability to control it on our own. How we must surrender that control over to Christ. Uh, This week we're going to continue looking at some of those points we looked at last week. The danger of the tongue and learning to control it. And so if you would stand one final time for the reading of God's word this morning. We'll read uh, verses 5 through 8 of James chapter 3. James 3, 5 through 8, we'll read this, we'll pray, and we'll get into our message for today. The Word of God says, Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Let's pray and we'll get started this morning. Lord, uh, we thank you for the ability to come before you. Lord, that is no small thing. Lord, it is a blessing that you allow us to own a copy of your word. Lord, to have the freedom to read it. Lord, whenever we want to. Lord, to have the ability to come here in this building, Lord, and worship you as a local body of Christ. Lord, none of those things are things that ought to be taken for granted. Lord, they are great things that have been afforded to us. Lord, through the sacrifice of many in our nation. Lord, quite honestly, through the greatest sacrifice that was made on the cross for us. Lord, without salvation, there's no reason for any of us to be here. Lord, without Jesus Christ loving us, coming to earth and dying in our place, there's no reason for any of us to sit in this room this morning. And so we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that this morning uh, the words that are said would be honoring and glorifying to you. Lord, I pray that it would not be me that speaks this morning, but Lord, that you would use me as a vessel. Lord, you would use me as a mouthpiece merely to get your message across to people. Lord, that the message would be gotten across to myself. Lord, all of us struggle with our tongue. Lord, I pray that you would bring conviction where it is necessary in each and every one of our lives this morning. Lord, that we might be made to look more and more like you, that we would grow up into the stature of your likeness. Lord, be with this message. We ask that you would use these next couple of minutes to honor and glorify yourself. And all this we pray in the name of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. This morning we're going to look at uh, two aspects, two actions uh, related to the tongue. Uh, The first one that we're going to look at we'll find in verses 5 and 6. That is the flaming of the tongue, the burning of the tongue. I want to start this morning by talking about the flaming and really start by talking about the start of that flame. 
We find the start of that flame in verse number five of James chapter three, really the second half of that verse where that paragraph, that new paragraph starts. It says, behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Perhaps that word matter in your version of the Bible is translated as woods or forest or thicket. Essentially what the verse is getting across is that a large plot of land, a lot of trees, a lot of things can be lit on fire from simply a little flame, a little fire. When we start about the, when we talk about the start of this flame, we recognize according to scripture that it only takes a little fire uh, to start great flames. Growing up, I had the opportunity to go camping a lot with my family and really with my friends as I got older. And I can tell you, we, whenever we wanted to start a fire, we never started with something massive. Usually we started with a, a lighter or a match, something small. And from that, uh, we grew it into something large. You see, it only takes a little fire uh, to cause great flames. Uh, back home, Julie and I are, are originally from Maryland, and right now they're under a fire watch. They've been having forest fires uh, really in, in a lot of different places. Julie and I were just out in Boone for the last couple of days, and she asked me to check and, and see what the, the temperature rating was and what the fire warning was. Why? Because it only takes just a little spark. It only takes just a, a little flame to light everything on fire. And the truth is, once that little spark catches, uh, once that little flame begins to spread, entire landscapes can be permanently altered by what starts as only a little flame. You see, it's when a little fire is mishandled that it causes big issues. That's what James 3 verse 5 is telling us. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. It's when that little fire, that little match, that little flame is mishandled, isn't treated responsibly, isn't recognized uh, as something that could potentially be incredibly dangerous. It's when that little fire is mishandled, not taken seriously, not put into check, that it creates big issues. That fire spreads and everything changes. Businesses are destroyed. Homes uh, are wrecked. Lives can be lost, all because a little bit of fire was mishandled. This is how that flame starts, but as all of us know, flames don't just start, they spread. That's what James begins to show us in verse number six. The end of verse five says, behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. It says in verse six, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body. We see that that flame doesn't just start, but it spreads. James lets us know that in case the illustration isn't clear, that the tongue is that fire. Just last week as we examined that the tongue is a small thing, he likens our tongue to a small fire that has the ability to devastate great areas. Our tongue is a small fire that has the ability to destroy businesses around us wreck the homes that you and I are a part of, and quite frankly, end the lives of those around us. As I said, James lets us know that the tongue is that small flame. He lets us know that it burns with a fire of evil and ungodliness. You see, that's, that's the danger of fire is that sometimes it can be a good thing. Uh, oftentimes we recognize that we need fire even to survive. It provides light and warmth, but sometimes fire can be a dangerous thing. Sometimes it can be a, an, uh, a deadly thing. That's what James is saying here, that this fire that our tongue burns with is both evil and ungodly. The Bible makes sure that we understand this uh, from the book of Proverbs. Turn to Proverbs 16 with me this morning, if you would. Proverbs 16 and 
verse 27, see how our words are described by Solomon. Proverbs 16, verse 27, it says, An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is a burning fire. What do we recognize about the burning fire in our mouths, the burning fire that is our tongues, according to James, that it is inherently tied to both ungodliness and evil. This is what our tongue is is burning with. This is what our tongue stands ready to spread to those around us is evil and ungodliness. It, according to James, represents an entire world full of iniquity and injustice. That's what James tells us according to our text. When we look at that verse, James chapter 3, verse 6, it says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, represented in your tongue as an entire world's amount of iniquity and injustice. When we look at the world around us, we see a a lot of bad things. We see a lot of mistreatment. We see a lot of hatred. We see a lot of crime. We see a lot of ungodliness taking place in this world. And if we were to take all of the ungodliness that goes on all over the face of our planet and we were to try and set it on one side of a scale, it would be an innumerable amount of sin. It would be an an unscalable amount of disobedience and iniquity towards God. And James tells us that our tongue is so dangerous, our tongue is so evil, that it in and of itself represents an entire world's amount of sin and evil and ungodliness. That's how dangerous our tongue can be. That is the burning that takes place just behind our own lips. So many of the sins that you and I see in the world, so many of the sins that you and I personally struggle with on a regular basis, all either have their root or their fruit in our words, in our tongue. All sorts of things. Anger. Lashing out takes place with our words. Pride, puffing ourselves up, thinking way too much about ourselves is often expressed through our words and the things that we say. Division that takes place, whether it's in our homes or in our churches, is often rooted and has its fruit in the things that people say to one another. We could go on and on. We could talk about unfaithfulness especially in relationships between husbands and wives, often is exasperated and pushed to the next level when we have conversations with other people that we ought not to be having. Bitterness is shown through our words. Gossip that takes place where we discuss one another in a wrong way behind each other's back all takes place through our lips, from our tongue, with our words. Lying, cursing, slander, all of these things that you and I struggle with all have a common factor of being tied to what we say, what comes out of our mouths. Look what Christ had to say about this. Turn your Bibles to Mark 7 with me, if you would. Mark chapter 7, verse number 20. Look what Christ says in these verses. Mark 7, verse 20, it says, And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed what? Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. What is Christ telling us? That all of this sin begins to find a root in our heart. And then what happens? It grows. 
until it is acted out or spoken out in our lives. Our tongues can be such dangerous things. James isn't being uh, extra. He's not going over the line when he says that our tongue represents an entire world of sin and disobedience and iniquity. And yet many of us don't look at our words that way. We look at them merely as passing things or, or a, uh, actions or words that, that don't have a lot of meaning or bearing on other people when all the while the Bible is quite honestly screaming at us about the danger that lies behind our lips. James lets us know that our tongue is that fire, that it burns with evilness and ungodliness, that it represents an entire world of iniquity and injustice. And then he shows us that those flames, as real flames do, will inevitably spread. That's what fire does. It spreads. That's what James tells us it does. In verse 6 of James 3, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body. Your tongue has the ability to ruin everything about you. It has the ability to spread. That word defile there that we read in our text, it means to stain. Like a, a stain that continues to spread and, and, and move around. And it constantly keeps getting on everything that it touches. Uh, James tells us that this fire defiles us. That it stains us. That it continues to spread throughout our being. Leaving its mark on every place. Just as fire spreads and chars all that it touches. You know when something has been touched by fire because there is evidence of it. Two weeks ago, Julie and I had the opportunity on, on Monday, my day off, to, to go up to Pilot Mountain and to go hiking. Uh, and, and as we were hiking, we looked to the left and right of us and we keep seeing trees that were burned. Uh, and there the, the rangers use fire to actually help keep things under control. But the point of the matter is that you could tell which trees have been burned. There's a charring on them. There's a, a, a marking on them. You see, the, the fire inevitably stains everything that it touches. Just as fire spreads and chars all of it, all that it touches, the words that you use have the ability not only to affect and stain and burn and char those around you, but it also has the ability to burn and spread to and char every aspect of your own person. You see, the words that you use determine the person that you are. Understand something about fire. Fire spreads much quicker through the things that are dead and dry than it does through the things that are living and well watered. When we were growing up and we were making fires, like I spoke about earlier, we didn't want to find trees that were living and, and, and try and cut branches off of those and burn them. Why? Because there's life in them. They're hydrated. They're alive. They're not dry and dead. No, that's what we were looking for because that's what burns easier. That's where the fire can spread through faster. And the truth of the matter is that you open yourself up significantly more to both burning yourself and being burned by others when your spiritual life is dry and dying than it is when you are planted by rivers of living water, being spiritually watered and spiritually alive. But look what Psalm 1 says. Turn with me to Psalm 1 if you would. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 4. Psalm 1, 1 through 4 gives us a warning that goes hand in hand with what James just said. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, 
nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. What should he be like? He shall be like a tree. Planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Verse 4 tells us that the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. You know what makes a leaf wither and fall off the tree? I mean, if you go outside, You'll see already it's happening. Leaves are falling on the ground. And what happens when you step on them? They're crunchy. They break apart. They dissolve. Why is that? Because there is a dryness to them. There is a deadness to them. Trees shrivel up, wither, and die when they're not being watered. So too Christians, when they are not planted in God's word when they're not seeking to be fed by the Holy Spirit, when they're not getting into this book and spending time on their knees in the presence of God, spending time with their families and around God's people, constantly drinking in the living water of God's word, become dry. They become dying Christians. And what happens? They get burned. Either by themselves or those around them. The farther away you are from Christ, the more you open yourself up to the danger of the tongue, of hurting yourself and those around you and being hurt by others, burned by others, charred away. This is what the word of God tells us. Are you burning away your own life with an uncontrolled tongue? Have you removed yourself so far from the streams of God's word and mercies that you're dry and brittle as a Christian and as such finding that you are constantly catching yourself and your own life on fire by an uncontrolled tongue? Many of you perhaps even this morning are setting fire to parts of your life and burning away relationships with the words that you use. Perhaps even today, many of you know that this is true by having your tongue be uncontrolled, by having your life be drawn far away from Christ. You've become dry and dying as a Christian and you found that you lash out with your words and use them in an improper way. And perhaps even this morning you have burned away the relationship that you have with your husband. Perhaps even this morning you've found that you're burning up and away the relationship that you have with your wife with the words that you use and the way that you respond to her. Maybe you've burned away the relationship that you have with your kids or maybe you've burned away the relationship that you have with your parents. Perhaps the connection you once had with your siblings, you've burned it up and flamed it away with an uncontrolled tongue. Maybe it's the people that you work with, there's a friction and an animosity there because you cannot seem to control how you interact with others with the words that come out of your mouths. And all the while, each and every one of these relationships that we keep lighting fire to over and over again by not giving attention and focus to the words we use, all that time we are burning up the fellowship that we have with our Savior. For through each and every relationship that the Lord has allowed you to have, you are to seek to glorify Christ through it. And that's what relationships are all about. Yes, I'm with my wife because I love her, but more importantly, it's so that the two of us can glorify Christ together. Yes, I love you guys as members of this congregation, but it's not just because I care about you and you care about me. Together, we're supposed to do what? Glorify the Lord through our relationships. But when I'm constantly setting fire to them and tearing them down and burning them down because I refuse to let my tongue be controlled by the Lord, guess who's not being glorified? God. Guess who's not being honored and praised through my relationships? Christ isn't. And so with 
every match that my tongue shoots out at the relationships that I have, I not only burn them, but I burn up the fellowship that I have with my Savior. You want to know what the worst part is about burning something? Is that you can't rebuild it with its broken pieces. If, if I were to, if we were building a house and, and one of the studs uh, got broken, I can technically take those two pieces and just reattach them. But when I burn something, there's no broken pieces left to utilize. Uh, we can rebuild it, but what do we have to do? We have to bring in new materials. There is no broken pieces to rebuild from. James doesn't tell us that our, our, our tongue is an, an axe or a sledgehammer that breaks things in half. No, he tells us that it's a fire that burns things, that reduces businesses, homes, lives, relationships to ash. And the only way they're fixed is by introducing something new into them. This is the danger of the flame of our tongue that it starts, that it spreads. But James goes even a step further. He tells us the source of that fire. Uh, where does the fire that our tongue burns with come from? What makes it that way? Well, James tells us back in our verses, James 3, verse number 6. It says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body. It setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. The fire that our tongues burn with, according to scripture, comes from hell. That is the source of the fire contained in your tongue, is that it comes from hell. And so we must ask ourselves the question, which eternity do our words represent? The way that I speak to others around me, the way that I speak to my Savior, the way that I interact in the relationships that God has given me, which eternity do my words represent? Do they represent one of honor and worship and praise for our Savior and our King of kings and our Lord of lords? Or does it represent the place of wrath and justice and punishment and darkness and burning because our tongue is set on fire of hell? Where does your tongue tell people that you're headed? If I had to judge the destination of your eternity merely based off your words, which eternity does it represent? Where should I think that you're going based on what your tongue tells me and those around us. When our words are wrong, the Bible tells us that we represent something called the Valley of Gehenna. Maybe your Bible translates actually in verse 6 that it is set on fire of Gehenna or, or, or hell. Those two words are used in the, interchangeably. The Valley of Gehenna is something that we find in the Old Testament let me show you what our words represent when they're lit on that fire. Turn to, to Jeremiah chapter 7. That word hell in the New Testament is, is translated from that word Gehenna. It comes from this place right here in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse number 30. This is a real place. When our words are wrong, we represent this place. Jeremiah 7, verse number 30, it says, For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, saith the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name to pollute it. They have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom. That word Hinnom is that same word as Gehenna. When our words are wrong, this is the place we represent. Let's read what this place is. Verse 31, it says, They have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not. 
neither came it into my heart. You see, in the Old Testament, when God's people walked away from him to serve other idols and false gods, they would take their little baby boys and their little baby girls and they would bring them to this place that was lit on fire with these big metal statues and they would lay their child on the metal hands of that statue to let the sin, the the skin sear and burn and offer that child in the flames to that false god. That's what those flames are. And what James is telling us is that when our words are wrong, when they're not shaped by Christ and representative of our Savior, that they burn with the very same fire that people used to offer their little baby boys and their little baby girls to false gods. That's how evil and wicked our tongue is. It's not some small thing. It's not some light thing that maybe we should put in check or calibrate maybe once a month. No, this is a day-by-day thing that must be dedicated to the Lord because of the evil it represents and the danger that it poses. This is the flaming of our tongue. Moving swiftly for sake of time, going back to our text. James 3, look at verse 7. We've seen not only the flaming of the tongue, but now James shifts gears and talks about the taming of the tongue. He says in verses 7 and 8, For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. James starts out by telling us what we can handle. He says, or we see that James transitions from discussing the destructive power of the tongue to attempting to control that power. He does so by giving us an illustration about all of creation. He says, all of creation can eventually be tamed. And we see this all the time. With enough time and with enough attention and with enough power, there's not many animals in creation that people haven't tried to domesticate. Uh, I'm not saying that it's wise to have a pet anaconda or a pet tiger or whatever that thing may be, but people do that. With enough time, with enough power, and with enough attention, any animal can be handled. Any animal can be trained or tamed. You see, mankind tries itself by trying to uh, conquer adversity. Uh, Just this last couple of days, Julie and I went hiking, and I can safely say we hiked the most difficult trail I've ever hiked in my life, And, and I've hiked a lot. I mean, it was difficult, but at the end, there was a sense of accomplishment. Why? Because we had conquered adversity, something that shouldn't have been able to be tamed. We were able to do it through our own strength uh, and our own efforts. We see that all the time mankind tests itself by doing things like this, landing on the moon or swimming the Atlantic or climbing Everest or even things like advancements in modern medicine. We push and try by our own strength to reach some level that was thought to be unattainable. But the truth is there's something that we can't handle. There is something that we cannot conquer. And the Bible tells us that that is our tongue. What we may have been able to do all of those things, what we cannot do is control our tongue. Verse 8 says that the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil. That word unruly means restless, uh, not quiet. Uh, My wife and I, we have a dog. I'm not an animal person. Uh, I I did not grow up with animals, and and I can remember the day that we got it from the shelter. She's like, just pick it up and put it in the back seat. For someone that's not an animal person, picking up a dog is not easy, right? I, I, I don't even know where to grab it. I'm trying to scoop under it. And what's it doing the whole time? It's wiggling and, and, and shifting and it's trying to get away from me. What is it? It's restless. It's unruly. It's so hard for me to be able to get control over that thing, that or keep it quiet. You ever try, if your dog is loud, you ever try to keep it quiet? And it seems like when you try to do that, it just keeps barking louder and louder and louder. I know ours gets like that sometimes. Um, that's what that word means. It says the tongue is unruly, restless. 
Anytime you try to pick it up or control it, 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 it gets outside of our control. It gets outside of our grasp. Anytime we try to keep it quiet or keep it from lashing out on its own, what does it do? It continues to be louder and louder and louder. Scripture is trying to show us how lethal our tongue is. It not only cuts down, but what does it do? It poisons others. Look what Psalm 140 has to say. Turn with me to Psalm 140. Not only is our tongue something that cuts, but it is something that poisons. Psalm 140, starting in verse number one, the word of God says, Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man which imagine mischiefs in their hearts. Continually are they gathered together for war. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. And adder's poison is under their lips. You see, words not only cut us, but they poison us. They stick in our minds. They linger. You know, you, you cut yourself or you get uh, hurt or bruised. Eventually it goes away, but the things that someone says to you, they stick for years and years, poisoning our minds and causing us to dwell on those things. What makes our words poisonous? Surely not everything I say is poisonous. I hope that standing up here that I'm not spewing poison from the pulpit. So what makes our words poisonous? What makes them harmful to others? Well, the Bible tells us, go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy 29, verse 16. The Lord is speaking to his people, giving them a warning. And look and see what we read here. Deuteronomy 29, 16. For ye know how we have dwelt in the land of Egypt, and how we came through the nations which ye passed by, and ye have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them. And then he says in verse 18 lest there should be any among you, man or woman, or family or tribe, whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God, to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. Those two words mean poison and bitterness. What makes our words poisonous is when we turn away from God. When you separate yourself from him, not only do you become dry and brittle and withered as a spiritual being, but you begin to lace everything you say with spiritual poison. This is what we cannot handle is our tongue. And so just as we saw last week, what must we do? We must hand it over to Christ. If no person can tame the tongue, what can we do? I mean, isn't that what James tells us at the end of verse number eight? Or at the beginning of verse number eight, it says, but the tongue can no man tame. Does that leave us helpless? Does that leave us hopeless? If no person can tame the tongue, what ought we to do? The answer is simple. Turn it over to its maker. Uh, when you can't get your appliance to work at home, eventually what do you do? You, you call the manufacturer and, and you ask them to fix it for you. That's how it is with our tongue. Try as you might, and you might think you're the best biological mechanic there is, able to service and control and fix your tongue. But after enough failure, we have to recognize that we can't fix it. Only its creator can. Only its master can. That's what Psalm 23.3 tells us. He restoreth my soul. Only he is the one that's able to fix that for us. And so if we want our tongue to not be poisonous, to not cut others, if we don't want ourselves to be dry and brittle people that are easily set on fire, if we want to stop burning away every relationship that we have, burning ourselves, ruining the fellowship that we have with Christ, we must let him take control of the tongue. You see, the heart must be renewed if the words are going to be renewed. Your tongue will never say the right thing if your heart is wrong. 
And I say that really to say that if you do not know Christ, your words cannot be Christ-like. If you've never truly been saved, if Jesus has never actually saved you from your sin, if the gospel has never been real to you, you've never acknowledged that you need him to save you, then try as you might, you will never be able to have godly words because the Bible tells us that you are an ungodly person. The heart must be renewed if the words are going to be renewed. That's what Luke tells us. I'll read it for us real quick. Luke 6, 45. The Bible tells us, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth fruit which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of his heart the mouth speaketh. If your words are ungodly, maybe that's because your heart is ungodly. Maybe what you need this morning is to give your heart to the Lord or to re-give your heart to the Lord. The heart must be renewed if the words are going to be renewed. Not only that, but old words must be put to death daily so that new words can live. That's what the Bible tells us. If your old words are not crucified, there is no room or space for your new words to live. That's what Luke tells us in chapter 9, verse 23. The word of God says in Luke 9, 23, And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. Christ says if you want your words to stop burning with the fire of hell, that they have to be put to death each and every day, so that Christ's words can live in you, and come out of you. The heart must be renewed if the words are going to be renewed. The old words must be put to death so that new words can live. And lastly, if, if you want Christ's words in your lips, then Christ must live through you. If there's one verse that we're going to get as a church before the Lord either calls me home or out of here, it's going to be Galatians 2.20. Let's finish by turning there this morning. Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20. If you want to have Christ's words in your lips, then Christ must live through you. Galatians 2.20, it says, I am crucified with Christ. The old words put to death. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. My heart has been renewed. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If you're tired of burning away your relationships... If you're tired of being burned yourself and watching areas of your life be reduced to nothing but piles of ash because of an uncontrolled burning tongue, if you're tired of putting all of the effort into trying to tame something that the Bible says you don't have the strength to tame, then let Christ renew your heart. Let Christ give you the strength to put the old man, the old words to death, and let Christ live in you, that your words might be seasoned with salt and that they might represent the Savior that died to save you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we come to the end of our service. We're going to have a time of invitation a time for us to respond to what God's word has told us this morning. And as the piano begins to play, I'd ask you to consider which eternity do your words represent? We spent a lot of time over the last couple of weeks talking about that our works are evidence of what is true about our faith. Where do the works of your words tell your soul that it's going? Do you speak as if Christ has renewed your heart and your mind? Understand, you will never have renewed words 
until you have a renewed heart. Maybe what you need this morning is salvation. You need Christ to save you. You recognize that you do things that are wrong, that you sin. The Bible tells us that sin has separated us eternally from God. Just as, if, just as you cannot control your tongue, there is nothing you can do to fix your relationship with God. It cannot be mended, just as the tongue cannot be tamed. Only Christ can mend that relationship. The Bible tells us that he has every intention and desire of doing that. That he went to the cross as a sinless person to die in your place for the ungodly words and actions that we so often do that have separated us from God. If this morning you know you need to be joined back to God, you need that relationship mended, you need Jesus to save you. Nobody is looking, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. All I'd ask you to do is to slip your hand up. Say, I know I need Jesus to save me. Perhaps what you need this morning is a rededication. You recognize that your Christian life has grown dry and brittle. Yes, you come to church, but you know you're not a tree planted by rivers of living water. And the evidence is all over your life. You lash out with your words. You're unkind. You see fruits of gossip, lying, cussing, anger, bitterness, slander all over your life. And you say, I, I can't live far from Jesus anymore. I can't live a dry and dying Christian life. I need to be close to him again. I need him to take control of the rudder of that ship. I need him to guide me close to himself. I need him to control my tongue because I can't do it. Maybe this morning you're ready to finally surrender control of your tongue over to Christ. Let me encourage you, if that's you, to just come and do business with the Lord here at this altar. Do not let others' perception of you keep you in your seat. Be right with God above everything else. I'll be quiet for a moment, give people the opportunity to respond as the Spirit is leading them, and then we'll take time to close our service. church. Lord, I thank you for the people that are in it. But Lord, most of all, I, I thank you for you. Lord, I thank you that you loved us enough to die for us. Lord, that when we were lost and dead in our trespasses and sins, according to the scriptures, Lord, that you died for us, that you might quicken us, you might make us alive, you might renew our hearts and draw us unto yourself. Lord, I pray that we would remember what James has said this morning. Lord, that we would do a close examination of our hearts. We would recognize that so often that they burn. Lord, that our tongues burn. Lord, that we allow them to drift far from you. We get our eyes off of you and we begin to burn and have poison in our words. Lord, I pray that we would be close to you. Lord, I pray that you would help to transplant us, Lord, back by those rivers of living water, that we might bear fruit that is honoring to you, pleasant to you, Lord, please. God, I, I ask that you would help us to control our words, not by any strength of our own, but by your strength. Lord, that it would be you truly that controls us. Lord, that we would surrender control over to you, that our hearts would be renewed. Lord, that our old flesh, our old words would be put to death daily by the strength of the Savior. And that we would let you live through us. 
that we would remember what the Bible tells us. And Lord, that we would walk out of here as changed people. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, we thank you for mercy and grace that even in the midst of our failure to speak the right way, you still offer mercy and grace to us. Lord, that you don't cast us away when our words are improper and not pleasing to you, but you offer us, Lord, a way to be reconciled and made right. Lord, I pray that we would commit the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart to you, that they might be pleasing in your sight. And all this we pray in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All righty. Well, that brings us to the end of our service this morning. Uh, like I.